So I have never started an academic lecture with a prayer before, but I suspect that on this occasion I might be forgiven. Not being an expert on William Temple, or theology for that matter, despite all those fellowships, I suspect much of what I say is more homily than an objective analysis of Temple. For me, Temple is less church history and more a part of our collective ecclesial conscience. Besides, much of what I say has been addressed, or much of what I would say has been addressed already with better expertise than mine. So find room in your hearts to forgive that cardinal sin and allow me to preach a little. I often say my job description should be the traveling salesman of the Church of England, so let me try compel you on what I hope is a vision of the Church of England in the spirit of William Temple. So let, let me begin in prayer, and please join me if you feel free. May the words of my limp tongue and broken, imperfect thoughts be God-breathed to compel your hearts. May they reach into your minds and lives and challenge and inspire and nourish you as the Spirit wills, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So last night, um, we had a drink in the pub. Jeremy took us to dinner, and uh, me and Elaine and Jeremy sat there in the pub and um, um, discussed William Temple, as you would do if you are a William Temple scholar. And um, we, we um, played the magic eight ball game. What would... Um, Temple have said on sexuality, on marriage, as Elaine so profoundly explored earlier. What he, would he have said about euthanasia or ecotheology or the environment as Jeremy explored? And now, as we might ponder, what would he had, have said about racial justice? Professor Lee, who is the chair of the William Temple uh, Scholars, um, did a, a, wrote a sparring blog with me not so long ago, and, and he asked me, well, did William Temple have white privilege? And my answer was, of course he did. I have no doubt that William Temple was privileged. The son of an archbishop with a whole tapestry of blue-blooded connections running through his veins, enjoying the privileges of being born to the first gender, uh, in, to the halls of power and influence, as Professor Gill just, just described. By virtue of race, class, and gender, he had a little currency to make his voice heard, more currency than most in this country. I have no doubt, I have no illusions that William Temple um, had all those privileges we talk about, and that he had those fallibilities, those prejudices and gaps of empathy we all suffer in one direction or the other. We are not here to say he was superhuman. But we are not the sum of our parts, and William Temple's greatest achievements is he did not let those qualities define him or limit him, who he was or who he made a difference to. As academics, as clerics, as scholars of this particular area, we are drawn to William Temple because of the genius of his public policy, because of the creativity that he used and by no means least in theology, ecclesiology, and even liturgy. For what is liturgy if not matter that communicates the revelation of God? And I often claim that the headstone in the graveyard, um, the baptismal font, the stained glass, um, are all mediums of liturgy. It attempts to reveal the, to the world something of the nature of our go between God. And William Temple's genius was that he turned public policy into liturgy. That is no by, by no means a mean feat. And I say this as somebody who works very hard in that parliamentary space with bishops and archbishops. Now, all this adulation is well and good, and it sounds grand, and there is plenty of it today. But the academics among you might ask, what does it have to do with racial ju justice? Which brings me to another significant conundrum we discussed in the pub. How do we locate William Temple? Because in reality, I have heard scholars use cherry-picked quotes to claim many paradoxical claims about William Temple. And he suffers the same fate that many dead theologians and philosophers might suffer from today. Um, we, fit into, we fit him into whatever argument we might want to take. We cherry-pick those quotes and say, 
make him say what we want him to say. Mostly, we can only reach out to how we each understand him and how each of us are inspired by him. But I will ask more, um, a more important question than merely where do we locate him or how are we authentic to his meaning. I will ask how does William Temple's legacy shape racial justice discourse in the Church of England today? And I am convinced that if it wasn't for William Temple and other archbishops like him, but particularly Temple, that we would not have the privilege to inhabit a church so bound to justice, not mere social justice, but a theologically rich, ecclesiologically broad liturgy of public policy. If I could reduce William Temple to one Bible verse, I might pick um, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. As Tolkien might say in Sir Ian McClellan's trembling baritone, all we have to decide is what to do with the time given to us. And we can all agree that that is exactly what William Temple did. He made church public policy and discourse a phoenix of theology. He betrothed the church to the state and charted its course to a public theology. And it is a map we here today are privileged to have inherited. For somebody um, who works in the mission and public um, department in, in Church House, it is a particularly grand theology that I have inherited and that I cherish. So two years ago, the Church of England announced its plans to develop a vision and strategy for the 2020s. And just before the, the pandemic hit, Archbishop Stephen uh, asked me whether I might join the first iteration of its discernment process. It was a strange experience. It was mostly senior bishops and clergy, and I was still at Birmingham University at that uh, time. I was a vocationally confused cognitive psychologist in a, a specializing in ecclesiology in a philosophy, theology, and religion department. Um, and I was dabbling in a million things from pedagogy, statistics, to heuristic um, methodologies, and teaching and, and researching amongst uh, philosophy, theology, and um, religion scholars. I'm sure I wasn't the only person there who thought, what in the world is she doing here? How does she fit? And then the pandemic hit. It hit us like a tidal wave, this nation that had been hungry for, for a revival, a generation that had been lost to the innovations of postmodernity, that had begun to consider the episcopal polity mere ornamentation of national identity, was lost to an unexpected anguish. As the pandemic swept through the planet, Google and Siri were unable to satisfy the questions people ask in this ominous, uncharted in-between. Our indifferent pursuits of self-interest, which had torn up the roots of, of our community and robbed us of the riches, the, the generous moments of fellowship and kinship and belonging to each other and the land, was paused. As we realized we were one creation, what infects one infects us all. And as the bustle of dislocated global industry sputtered to a halt, and the world took compassionate leave in slow Sabbath indulgence. A soft, whimpering, deep innocence emerged with contrite trepidation. We were ready to reimagine church. We, the Church of England, was ready for a Pentecostal fire to, to set our Episcopal upper room aflame and the passion of the gospel to course through our ecclesia like a heady inebriation. And almost a century ago, a young, ambitious clergyman from a parish in Piccadilly, who had just been made the canon of Westminster that summer, found himself speaking to the church's national mission uh, to Guy's Hospital Christian Union in, in the Christmas of um, 1919. And he famously said, what is the church to say to this country? One of the things that has quite steadily grown in the minds of people who are working this movement is that phrase, national mission, must be make, taken to mean, not so much as a mission of national scale, 
as an effort directed to the national life itself, not as at the lives of individual people, but at the ordering of our national life, of those things which exist because as citizens we produce or tolerate them. I'd like to repeat, social ills because as citizens we produce or tolerate them. And the more powerful and privileged you are, the more complicit we are. Almost a century later, I had just left the ivory towers of academia and a career in higher education to join the National Church Institutions. For those of you who don't know uh, what the NCIs are, there's no such thing as the Church of England. This is the first rule of the Church of England. There's no such thing. There are seven national institutions and 42 dioceses, and then there are hundreds and thousands of um, organizations um, that are allied with this identity. And I'd like to think that William Temple Foundation is one of them. And though we are often accused of being a, a very ex exclusive club, or as I often say, an exclusive Sunday matinee of uh, an elite thespian guild, or perhaps the most expensive state-sponsored costume drama, we really claim to be the church for England. Or some might claim, um, as William Temple might say, the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. Now, my Roman Catholic Methodist or Pentecostal colleagues might say here, um, that's a really patronizing and grandiose claim, this church that is dying into obscurity at a steeper death rate than the pandemic at its height. You might be right. There's nothing as sobering as the knowledge that we are a church that is much reduced, that we were a church that had often lost our way, that had missed many harvests, that had betrayed the trust of our ancestors and the birthright of our heirs. But we were also a church of extraordinary heritage that calls a, community, a communion to embody church despite and because of our painful history in all our broken vainglory uh, eccentricities. And in that knowledge, we were capable of aching contrition and generous compassion and held the, the rich tensions and fragile human dissension in the bickering love and fellowship of ecclesial family. Like many errant sons of the Bible, our mutilating and disfiguring errors and the dark blemishes of our past had been reborn and sustained in grace. So where does that leave us in this uncharted in-between? Um, when I joined the NCIs about this time last year as the Archbishop's advice on minority ethnic Anglican concerns in the middle of this pandemic, in the public outcry that poured forth from uh, across the pla planet uh, at the murder of George Floyd. But a few just a few months before I joined the NCIs, when the world was still um, lost to this anxiety of um, of survival of, of, of a pandemic, Archbishop Stephen, speaking at his enthronement, reached back a century to the smog and rubble of the First World War and bore out the ecclesiological nudges and um, inspiration from Archbishop William Temple to meet the needs of this country. Um, Stephen said, this is a time of huge challenge, uncertainty and fearfulness in our world. I'm conscious that I'm standing in the shoes of some very great forebearers, not least a man like William Temple, who during the darkest hours of um, the Second World War um, with others dreamed of the, the peace, of what the peace may look like and how literally devastated cities would be rebuilt but also a moral vision for the rebuilding of a nation. Archbishop Stephen often says that he hopes the, to recapture the spirit of that post-war consensus as we attempt to reimagine this new normal we often talk about. And that's my hope too, that William Temple might uh, embody that, that new normal after this pandemic. Shortly after Stephen made this speech, I, I joined the Church of England, and in my first couple of weeks, um, in the Panorama documentary titled, Is the Church Racist, was aired. Um, the last four national advisers, the predecessors to my rule, had very publicly claimed the church was not fit for purpose, that it was systematically racist. And even our own archbishops, um, publicly at Synod, uh, have admitted that the Church of England is structurally and systematically racist. And I would dare to add, as William Temple might, 
There is no structural organization of society which can bring about the coming of the kingdom of God. Ask, what might William Temple say to these two movements? If you imagine um, to say black lives matter, suggest that white lives do not matter, you're missing the point. If you cannot see that black lives mattered so little in Western civilization that we even now have to plead our lives matter, perhaps you need to look again. I often say to the church that if we make our churches exclusive, a place where the marginalized and the oppressed do not find a home, that the marginalized might say to us, why should we believe you are calling us to that unseen kingdom? Why would you change a world that suits you so well? A place you have made a weaponized fortress against us. William Temple might add to this cause by reminding us that humility does not, it does not mean thinking less of yourself than of other people, nor does it mean having a low opinion of your own gifts. It means freedom from thinking about yourself one way or the other at all. The humility which consists in being a great deal occupied about yourself and saying you are of little worth is not a Christian humility. It is one of self-preoccupation and a very poor and futile one at that. William Temple's Ecclesiology of Humility was a response to a particular kind of muscular Christianity that that age had inherited from the Victorian age, an age I might add, um, speaking of the Victorians, um, that held true the tenets of um, the doctrine of African inferiority to justify church-owned slave plantations, where USPG and SBCK, an organization that I'm a trustee of, branded people of color like me, as if we were cattle. Liturgy and Bibles that were mangled and distorted to remove liberation theology inherent to its text in case it gave colon the colonized ideas. A generation or two later, Temple's response was deeply theological and contributed to resetting the theology held by Anglicans around the world. My worth is what I am worth to God, and that is a marvelous great deal, for Christ died for me. Thus, incidentally, what gives to each of us is his or her. Highest worth gives the same worth to everyone. In all that matters, most are we equal. They say history doesn't repeat itself, but often rhymes. And so in the midst of um, the Trumpian era of muscular Christianity, Archbishop Stevens' vision and strategy team dreamed up a simpler, humbler, bolder church of missionary disciples. As I said before, William Temple's theology continues to shape our ecclesiology. So around this time, I was tasked with recruiting um, the commission members for the Archbishop's Racial Justice Commission. And in such, in an introductory in invitation, one of the country's foremost black theolo theologians, who we invited to be on the commission, said to me, um, he declined the invitation, and he said to me, if you're on the side of um, racial justice, you must resign your post and never go to a Church of England church again. Otherwise, you are complicit in one of the most powerful engines of racism in the history of this country. That to keep on believing the Church of England might change made me either extraordinarily naive or utterly complicit. I was ashamed because I knew he was half right. But, and this is a big but, we are apprentices of that nomadic carpenter who called us to believe in the impossible. And as William Temple might say, remember that Christianity is not first and foremost a religion, it is first and foremost a revelation. 
It comes before us chiefly, not with a declaration of feelings. We are to cultivate our thoughts. We are to develop. It comes before us first and foremost with the announcement of what God is, as he is proved in what he has done. I would say this is true of the Church of England. The Church in England, the Church of England, from the moment it was seeded in this Albion soil was an extraordinary revelation. Those of you who are church historians, take it as far as you might, and you will find that there is no, no, nothing logical or, or coherent about the way it has developed. You couldn't predict the way it has evolved. If you told me five years ago that the Archbishop of Canterbury would apologize for racism, that the Archbishop's anti-racism task force would be installed, that they would make the kind of recommendations that they did, and that they would be listened to and taken seriously, I wouldn't have believed it. If you said that racism would take center stage at Synod and the church public life agenda, I wouldn't have believed it. If you told me the church was willing to commit resources to make things right, I wouldn't have believed it. If you told me the murder of a black stranger across the ocean would spiral a movement with, have an impact on what has long been conser considered the conservative party of prayer, I wouldn't have believed it. Much like I suspect that if I was found out, I wouldn't have believed a carpenter's virgin fiancé was going to bear the saviour to humanity. But as Temple so beautifully captures in a perfect ecclesiology, Christianity is first and foremost a revelation, a revelation about the nature of God, of a savage, unpredictable go-between in omniscience, tender and ferocious, wrathful and compassionate, and wild and wonderful beyond our strangest theologies. A God that has taken the broken ills of society and inspires hearts and minds to movement, that inscrutable, unpredictable divine that moves nations, and yes, even churches, on a rare occasion that blows from when or where or whither we do not know. As Hans und Urs von Balthasar, Resonating Temple, might say, a dynamic revelation that is potent like a storm on a theodramatic horizon. I like to imagine that every church smells of a thundercloud. So when I'm often frustrated at the Church of England, I... Uh, I think, you know, I'm still here because, like Temple, I believe that faith is a corporate movement, not a static statement of intention, but like our creed, a cosmic drama in the grain of a moment of faith-driven action. I believe that church is at its best like a flock of starlings. But in, in reality, I imagine we are even at our very, very best, a little like the early church fathers, even when we are set aflame by the spirit likely to be thought of as the early morning drunk, a little confused and weather-worn, a mild irritation to responsible citizens of the grand polis. And at our worst, we're a little like the Israelites coming out of Egypt, grumbling and irritated, ungrateful for our hard-won liberation from slavery, ready to turn back, to go back to the sure bondage of Egypt. If you despair of the Church of England and you count yourself in that belonging, remember what I said, or rather Temple said at that beginning in 1918 at Guy's Hospital. Social ills exist because as citizens we produce or tolerate them. But at the, as a consequence of the fall, as so aptly revealed in the Tower of Babel, it is that we have learned that only to trust what we can control, measure, predict, invest in or exploit. That is the great tragedy of our, our civilization. So I'm going to take you to that magic eight ball. Um, and I would say again, William Temple is not a magic eight ball and I don't know what he might have said about racial justice. But for all those of you here who are admirers of Temple, I might add to your shoulder this challenging work. With my own work and all that it entails this coming week, I'll leave you with a William Temple's question at the beginning of my homily. What is the church to say to this country? And how does the character of the church go forth to the nation to reveal Christ? And do we share the vision of the uncontradicted, unconditional love that Temple imbued in the church in his vision for the Church of England? Thank you. <laughs>